It's the Fellowship of the Geek Show, a weekly podcast about comics, the comic book industry, and other geek pop culture. Music courtesy of Manny the Martyr. And now, on with the show! Hey everybody! It's the Fellowship of Geeks podcast. My name is Thomas Chick, and joining me for this episode is Mike Marlowe. Hey, gang. Les Webster. Hello, all. And Liz Newman. Hello, everybody. So, how are y'all guys doing? Okay. Doing great. Okay. Okra you're just doing okay, Mike. You were doing good last week. Well, what the hell sh- happened? I got shit last week for doing good, too, so I thought I'd tone <laughs> it down a little. <laughs> well, you got shit for saying okay. <laughs> go. I know. I just can't win anymore. It's, it's kind of fun. I <laughs> uh, hope everybody out there is doing all right. So uh, what's been going on in your corner of the galaxy? Well, I figured out I was wrong, and not just about catching shit for um, being too happy last week. I was wrong in that Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was not the lightest thing in my pile last week, because there was one that I skipped over. There was one I forgot I had, honestly. Um, So I finished Fear and Loathing, and I read Volume 2 of the Black Monday Murders, which is dark. Of course. Um, And so now I have started Mythic. And if you don't remember Mythic, it was uh, written by Phil Hester, drawn by John McRae. Um, This was a couple years ago. Um, And it is a kind of a modern fantasy, the Mythic... uh, Oh, crap, what's the name of the company? Uh, Anyway, it's essentially this... they've, They've got this organization who kind of keeps in check all of the wild magics of the world and that's kind of they they've kind of got a bunch of like teams around the world that, that do that and so this is this is kind of their story and so it's it is actually it's it's kind of a an apocalyptic type story in a way um, they're always like saving the world that kind of thing Um but there's a good bit of humor in the book, so it is definitely lighter than most of the rest of the stuff in my pile. But so, I, like I said, I kind of just started that. I haven't read it in, in a while, so yeah, I am enjoying it so far. And, and I also watched Demon with the Atomic Brain. Yay! <laughs> that was downright funny too. That was that was a much more overt attempt at humor than the others I've watched so far of the Christopher Mim movies. This is we're I'm back on that again, or actually I'm kind of still on it. It just took me a little while to get get kind of through the one movie there, but yep, a lot of fun. I, I actually that, this is probably at this point this is probably my favorite one so far, just because like I said they're clearly attempting to make fun of stuff now. It's 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 a lot more obvious, and in some of the, in the other ones I've watched, it's a little more subtle. This is pretty blatant, and it is actually funny. So, cool. I'm glad to hear that. All right. Well, my little corner of the world's been good. <laughs> um, you know, part of the problem I have with ordering from a previews catalog is three months later, when everything starts coming in, it's like, what? <laughs> I ordered Did that? I order I this? Order, I don't remember the ordering that. <laughs> cool. I mean, it's cool. but So it's kind of like Russian roulette when you go into the comic book store. What's coming in today? But I did pick up a lot of interesting traits. So um, one of them was the Wormwood Saga. And that's just a cute story. The artwork in it is just amazing. I mean, I'm I'm always drawn to that bold. And it, I would say it wasn't cartoony, but it wasn't like your normal comic book artwork. So it was, it was really good. Cute story. I didn't realize that it 
the trade that's out for the first one gets you started. He's just entered into this world, and so I guess the second one will kind of see his battle there. But he's kind of caught in this daydream world, and his dad's like, come on, you know, you can't make a living in the daydream world. You're schoolwork, schoolwork. So you can kind of see where the story's going. Either he gets it together this summer or he goes off to a boarding school. So I had fun with that one, so I'll have to see if the second one's out or (laughs) did I drunk order that one? (laughs) (laughs) Is is that the Gentleman Corpse series? The Gentleman gentleman Corpse? No, no. This is just called um, the Wormwood Saga. Wormwood. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Worm World. Worm World. Saga. Yeah. Yeah. Not 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 the not the um not the worm. Uh, what's crap? What's, Wormwood. Kind of, what's, what's the artist's name? Temple Smith. It's not it's not the Temple Smith thing. This is right. uh, yeah. this is a German guy. Worm, yeah. Worm World Saga. Okay. okay. Yeah. Liz does, Liz does funny things with her L's sometimes. <laughs> it's Liz speak. <laughs> <laughs> but I got asked an interesting question. It's kind of like when people are like, hey, how do you breathe? And then you start thinking about it, and it's like, oh, my God, how do I breathe? <laughs> I don't know. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, and then you start gasping for air because you forgot how to breathe. My son asked me, how do you read comics? And I said, well, you just open the book and you read it. I mean, what do you mean? How do you read comics? And he says, no. Do you look at the picture first and then read it? Or do you read it and then look at the picture? And it was like, uh. That's a chicken or egg thing, man. I don't know. So now I've opened a comic book because it's like, how do I read this comic? Do I look at the pictures? Am I going to read this? <laughs> Three weeks ago, we asked her this. She, she's still on page one. <laughs> and then you find out it's anime, and I should have been at the last page. <laughs> right. You're going to read the damn thing backwards anyway. So, you know. It's like, wow, that's that's a good question. So next time when I'm not thinking about it, all I have to notice how I read a comic book, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely words first. But that's because I'm I'm an English guy. See, and I Smith. Yeah. I think with my ADD, it's the picture first, <laughs> and then I'm like, ooh, why did he just hit him in the face? <laughs> oh, wait, there's some words. Maybe he says why. why. I, I hit you says. in the face because. <laughs> why did that happen? Uh, read the book. Well, I want to look at the pictures. Or is it possible to do both at the same time? Maybe I'm that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm um, a lizard. Right. Hey, maybe that's what Liz is short for. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you know what Liz is queen. short for already. Why did I open that can of worms? <laughs> the lizard queen. The lizard queen. I can do anything. <laughs> Yeah, that that's my little corner of the world. <laughs> hey, who knew it was going to get so philosophical? Mm. Right. I made y'all think. <laughs> <laughs> Bless. I partook of the screening of um, the producers this weekend. And still laughed at what was going on. It is such a a tightly written uh, score, uh, yeah, script that it just makes you giggle every second of the movie, and then to take the time and to see the little nuances, the way somebody will roll their eyes or uh, show frustration or or fear as the uh, character Leo Bloom did just makes you break out in laughter again. 
uh, prior to the movie, they had Ben Mankiewicz from Turner Classics interviewing Mel Brooks prior to the screening in April at the Grounds Chinese Theater. Cool. And just the, the short clip they showed was great fun. Oh, I bet. And if you go see it, well, it, it'll be gone by this time next week. But uh, they do have a, a follow clip after the movie with Mel Brooks once again speaking at the uh, showing. And it's just witty as hell. Funny as can be. And they were very successful in doing this production. I'm hoping that they come back with some more uh, great movies to uh, for everyone to see because this is definitely one to take. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was part of the it was part of the um, film festival they had in in L.A. a few weeks ago, and this is like the 50th anniversary of of the of the original film. Yes. So that was that was that was that was why it was part of part of that, and I was it's awesome that it got a uh, screening across the across the country. It's a great film. And speaking of Mel Brooks, I just happened to come across last night. I caught it in time to get the the watch it from the beginning. Uh, History of the World Part One. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Uh, it's, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take us down a little bit, but I want to bring it right back up because I'm sitting here looking at the, the cast, you know, they, they show up the names of who's starring in the film. And I'm like, only Mel Brooks and Cloris Leachman are still with us. And I'm like, oh my God. And then, then you start watching the film and of course you start laughing your ass off. Such a funny film. Uh, I don't know which one I enjoy the best, the, either in Rome or or where they're in Paris. Because I still I still laugh my ass off with uh, the scene where uh, Mel Brooks is playing Comicus, the stand-up philosopher. Oh, a bullshit artist! Bullshit artist. <laughs> Trying to get unemployment insurance. Mm-hmm. Did you bullshit last week? No. no. Did you try the bullshit last week? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Yep. Such a great film. It is. I would really love to see that part two. Teaser at the end for part two would be it's just oh, yeah. phenomenal. There's, there's, oh man. Yep. That's a classic. It's a classic. There you go, Liz. Have you seen that one? I don't think I have. Uh oh. Yeah, we gotta fix it. Yep. Because <laughs> <laughs> our track record is so good with, with <laughs> movies for you, right? I was say, I'm almost scared to watch a movie, I'll suggest. <laughs> You've seen, you've seen other Mel Brooks movies, right? Oh, yeah, That's for right. sure. This is a Mel Brooks movie. Yes. I'll have to look that one up. But, I mean, just just the cast. You know, you got Madeline Kahn, Dom DeLuise, Gregory Hines, Harvey Korman, um, Ron Garney, uh, Sid Caesar at the beginning, uh, Narrate that Orson Welles. It's just such a great cast for such a a, f- a fun film. Hmm. It's good to be the king. Yeah, it is. Sire, you look like the fist boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway. Um... A 
amongst my reading this past week, I picked up a trade that has actually been out for a couple years, but uh, I had overlooked it. But I, I definitely wanted to pick it up, so I did. It's called Star Lord Guardian of the Galaxy. And yes, it is that Star Lord, but this is the material that came out uh, prior t- to the, him being put into the present day team. Um, the stories are, uh, they're in Marvel. Like Marvel Premiere magazines, Marvel Spotlight Comics. He had a couple of miniseries, that kind of stuff, dating back from the 70s to the 90s, I believe. But uh, with stories written by Steve Englehart, Chris Claremont, Doug Minch, uh, Timothy Zahn. And yes, that Timothy Zahn. Uh, and with art by John Byrne. Carmen Infantino, uh, Bill Sankovic, just to name a few. Some really great stuff. It was kind of cool to go back and check some of this out because it's material I've not read in forever. And I I was telling Les about this uh, a couple days ago. One of the stories I remember uh, was from, I believe it was Marvel Premiere Magazine. And doing a little research, this is like the third Star Lord story ever written. I remember my dad having this, and back in the time this when this came out, this magazine was geared a little bit more toward adults. And I was a kid; I was I was about five or six at the time, and I remember picking up this magazine and looking at looking at the art and. I don't believe this is my introduction to Carmen Infantino art because I believe I've seen some of it in reprints of of 50s and 60s Batman and Flash comics. But uh, I I do do remember the art style. So when I got the trade and was skimming through it for the first time, I came across that story. And I looked at it, and I told Les, I said, they made some alterations to this story. And and Les asked me why. I said, well, I I remember there being nudity in this story, especially the female character. It's not here now. (laughs) And like I said, it was was geared toward more uh, adult and, and it wasn't it wasn't anything sexual or anything. It just she just happened to be without apparel, and obviously they had to change that because you know it, you don't know who's maybe picking up that that book nowadays. So especially with it with the character being uh, more well known, especially toward all ages. So yeah. You don't want little Billy or, or Susie picking up that tray and start looking at it and go, oh, Mom, Dad, look at that. And them having a fit. So, <laughs> But it was interesting. It was it was great to kind of go back and look at those stories again. Cool. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And in fact, the boss man says, I'm going to have to order myself one. I said, yeah, I'll we'll go right ahead. <laughs> Don't take the moment. Yep. All right. Uh, before we get into this week's topic, uh, I want to take a couple of moments to thank the fine folks from Things from Another World for sponsoring the fellowship. And currently. Uh, the deals they are running are their evergreen sales, which is uh, 40% off comics, toys, and merchandise, uh, 30% off uh, select pre-order manga titles, and 50% off Nick and Dent comics. Uh, now, to learn more about these deals and whatever uh, 
there may be some other sales that come pop up after the, after the show drops. Uh, but if you want more information, uh, you can go to our website, www.thefellowshipofthegeeks.net, and click on our Sponsors tab. And there will be all these deals, including new ones that are, they come along pretty regularly, so you might want to keep checking here. And there's also going to be links that you can click to take you to their website, and that lets them know that we sent you their way. And just take advantage of some of these deals that are great deals that they're running right now, and thank you, things from another world. All righty. This week's topic, I, I have to admit up front, I don't remember what co- what's the situation that caused me to have this idea for, for this topic. So, um, but I wanted to discuss the uh, aging of, of characters in comics and whether that's a necessary thing or not. I think some of it stemmed from the fact that some characters you just you just never ever see age, and and while others do, uh, if we want to keep it just DC or Marvel related, just for ease, um, I mean, how old is Bruce? But we've seen that we've seen Dick grow up from. A young teenager to, I, I assume they still have him in his early to mid twenties. You know, um, you know how old is Bruce? I mean, how does that how old does that make him? I mean, is it even important? You know, because some people it may not be important, and but some it just it's it's kind of a well, you know, it'd be nice to know that kind of thing. So. I just kind of want to discuss if that was something. First of all, is that is that anything that y'all think about? And it doesn't necessarily have to be superheroes because we all read other uh, other comics that contain characters that move on from story arc to story arcs, whether it's an ongoing or a series of miniseries or or whatever. Um, is that important to you? And if it is, why? And if it's not, you know. It, Okay. Uh, hopefully it's not because it's going to be a real short, short show, but um, just kind of want to open it up and, and see what your viewpoints are regarding aging of characters. When I first saw the topic, it's not a comic, but my mind first went to The Simpsons. They've been on TV for, what, 29 years now? And the characters are exactly the same age and... You know, not a whole lot other than the artwork has changed with The Simpsons. I, th- I think that's part of the appeal is that um, you know who they are. And, you know, could you imagine Bart as a 50-year-old right now? <laughs> I mean, you know, it would, total, it would change the dynamic of it. But yeah. then, like you were mentioning the Robins, it was nice to see them grow up because of the, I guess, the learning that they had under Batman. Mm -hmm. So you kind of wanted to see what they did with that. But I think in terms of Batman himself, to me, I don't want to see him old. (laughs) Part of that, I guess when you watch or when you read somebody and you grow up with that person, I guess when they start aging, you realize you are too. (laughs) And that's your first hint. Right, <laughs> you know, you know, my kid walking across stage was another one, but uh, it's a big one, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I think that's part of the appeal is that they don't age, or some of them that they don't age, and you know, because I guess we get to this point in our life now where we're finding out that our own bodies are our kryptonite. So it's kind of nice to read a comic where they're not forlumed with the old person stuff, you know, but then you see things like old man Logan. They did that very nicely. Um, I didn't care for when they did it to Harley. (laughs) So, so I guess I'm on the fence 50, 50 on that one. 
Mm-hmm. In some stories, it doesn't matter to me, but in other stories, it's kind of like, ooh, yeah. please don't. <laughs> well, you you mentioned The Simpsons. An, another, going back to a comic book form, which not that The Simpsons aren't on com- in comics, but Archie's. They're perpetually teenagers in high school. Yep. I mean, they have been since the, since the 40s, since they first were created. And, yeah, I mean, every once in a while, you know, they they did the whole life with Archie with them out of high school and, and getting married, that kind of stuff. But beyond that, it pretty much still sticks with them being teenagers, and that's part of the appeal, and I get that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's just that, you know, it's, it, I wouldn't mind seeing some aging, and I think it matters, especially with... Uh, some characters' origins, you know. You know, we, oh, I think we've talked about it before the fact that they had to update Iron Man's origin because he was in was it Vietnam when all that happened, or was it in Korea? Les, do you remember? It was, it was Vietnam. It was Vietnam. Yes, sir. And then, uh, then obviously, you can't really use that nowadays, so they updated it to where it was Afghanistan. Because yeah. all of a sudden, you use, you know, if you're still using Vietnam, you're actually dating the character. They did the same thing to Punisher. Yeah. He served in Nam, and I think they made it Iraq. Yeah. Here recently. Uh, well, in the case of the Fantastic Four, they dropped out the whole fact that Reed oh. and, and Ben actually served in the war. You know, they, they, they took all that out. It's just they happened to be college roommates. Yeah. But yeah, I guess... Part of my little naive brain wants to think that part of these superpowers are they don't age. <laughs> you know? I mean, they can keep the flying and all that other stuff. I'd take that one, but, you know. It, it's hard to fly with a walker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Or when you can't see, you know. As long as you put your arm out to signal, that's all that matters. You have to, you have to give up the red cape for a white cane. <laughs> but then Spider-Man, part of his appeal is he is younger and still kind of wet behind the ears, and you know. Well, even even then, he started out in high school, and then we saw him go to college, and now he's doing what he's doing, which is out in the real work in the work world. Yeah, uh, working for the newspaper. So, I mean, there was some growing up there, but he's still probably late 20s, early 30s, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. He may be actually younger than that. But, you know. Go ahead, Mikey. You see, I'll, I'll throw in here. Um, you, you, you say that it doesn't necessarily have to apply to DC and Marvel. Um, I would argue that, in a way, it kind of does. Well, I mean... I mean, you also used Archie as an example, but the deal with them, with all three of those, is that they've got the whole continuity thing going on. They've been publishing stuff long enough that it matters, that it shows up. It's relevant, the aging thing, um, even if whether they're doing it or not. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conscious choice that they're having to make because they've been pr- publishing books for 40, 50, 60, 70 years um, you get into a, a short-run indie book, and it doesn't really make any difference because unless you've got some weird story that t- gets told over the course of, say, 300 years, it kind of doesn't matter if they're aging or not. So in a way, it, the, the continuity is where it matters. Okay. Fair point. I'm going to step up with this one. Uh-oh. I think it is relevant that they age. I think it's necessary that they age. The characters are uh, refurbished every 10, 20 years anyway. So to let them age to a point and then magically return to a, a segment of time, uh, although they 
like you say, with Iron Man, they change it from the Vietnam War to Afghanistan to make it relevant. Uh, there is a there is a specific case of where they change it to accommodate when New Fifty Two was running. Uh, Superman died at the end of the New Fifty Two run for the Superman titles. Spoiler. That was five years ago. <laughs> But, but the point there is that it uh, was a basis for them to bring back a previous uh, version of Superman, which they have done successfully and pushed it forward with uh, including Super Sons title. Uh, Batman has been the same way. How old is Batman now? Bruce has got to be 80 years old or better. And he still doesn't have a day over 35. That's true. But you also can think of it as each issue for each month is a day. Not a month, but a day in his life. Therefore, a year of stories is less than two weeks in his life. That's how I kind of accept it and uh, also can see how the aging process is in tune with uh, the stories. Right, and a lot of it is that you kind of just have to accept it. I mean, the the way they've done it is, like you said, every 10 or 20 years or so, they kind of grab hold of the continuity with both hands and give it a good solid shake so that they can, essentially so that they can bring everybody up to date so that they're not all 80 years old. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of the way they handle it. I mean, conversely, soap operas do kind of something similar, except that they can't quite keep the actors and, and, and everybody the same age as they were 40 years ago. And so they have to find ways to bring in new characters and then kind of retire the old ones and let the new ones be there so that the core characters are still all about the same age all the time and so it's kind of just a different way of handling it in the same fashion um god wouldn't it be great if they could all do what the simpsons do that would make things a whole lot easier yeah because what's fun is when the simpsons pull crap like they had an episode where um they actually did age um to it wasn't a whole lot it was like a year because Lisa, like, got moved up to second grade. Or third grade. I forget which. Whatever grade Bart's in. Because Lisa, mm-hmm. got, Lisa got moved up and Bart didn't. And so clearly a serious chunk of time took place within the confines of this episode. But next week they're all the same age again. And their age didn't actually change. Time had passed without them aging. Which is awesome, and you you can do that when they're all just lines on a page. Right. Um, makes it easier. The continuity thing that the the big two have to deal with um, oh. is almost forced on them from the outside. I mean, it's, it's almost they're forced on them by their fans who start whining when things don't make sense. Well, okay, so then we have to give the continuity a good swift kick. Um, and change some things in everybody's backstory so that they weren't in World War II they were in Vietnam instead and so okay so now they're not they don't have to be 55 now they can be 30 again and you can hang on that for a little while until we run into something else that's a huge historical fact that we just can't stumble over anymore and sweep under the rug we have to okay we have to jiggle things again so now they're now they're in 
Iraq instead of Vietnam. And okay, so now they're they're all thirty again. Yay. And the deal I mean, for me the whole deal is it's it's really gonna vary on a story by story basis. I mean some stories it just doesn't matter. Some stories take so little time within the story itself that it doesn't make any difference. Iron Man's not gonna age um in the course of this particular story arc. So it doesn't really make any difference. We can just sort of gloss over it. The fact that he's in another story arc six years down the road where he's still the same age and it still doesn't matter because it, there's not any obvious... Aging is something that happens so slowly that it doesn't show up in the immediate time frame. It doesn't show up right now. Um, where it gets fun, I think, is something like The Dark Knight Returns where you're intentionally dealing with an older Batman because that's the main part of the story is that Batman is older, he's jaded, blah, blah, blah. It's a different Batman. It's a different character. It's what Batman could become. And then if you want to, you can then spin that back and have him in the main book again, still being 35 all the time. So... It's it's kind of a story by story thing. It depends on what story you're telling and if age plays into that at all. So if as long as you're not telling stories about age, about how old people are, you know, you can get away with things. As long as you're not telling the story of how old man Logan dies of old age finally at whatever the hell age he is, because nobody really knows anyway. I mean, that's that's kind of a different way of going at it I guess but it's yeah it, it, it depends on the story really good point yeah. yep yep is there a character that you would like to see show the age no <laughs> trying to think of somebody because I, I didn't think about this before but I'm trying to think of somebody who's like kind of young and immature and you'd like to see them like 20 years down the road when they've actually gained a little wisdom from their life experience. <laughs> I don't know why I just thought of Gertie. <laughs> okay, that's a totally different <laughs> chapter to this story because that book starts off with her 35 years old stuck in the body of an 8-year-old. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a totally different that's that's another fun age based premise for a story right there <laughs> which is basically every South Park character 35 year old stuck in an 8 year old body <laughs> uh, uh, we could probably argue that one but <laughs> yeah. Sometimes... Simpsons came out first and they're only 29 so <laughs> To me, there are two people that I would like to see age at long last. One is Dennis the Menace. <laughs> okay. That kid has been around for so freaking long. It's time. He needs to go get a job and, and see what the world is like. And the other for me is the family circus. Those kids have been walking around for oh so many years. Even Gasoline Alley had had uh, the characters age and uh, Skizix ended up marrying somebody and having children and Things like that. It just, I mean, it, it was a fulfilling uh, process. And it, to me, it just made a freaking difference. Yeah, but is, does that, is that like an end game for the story? I mean, does the story go on from there? Yeah, it does. It, it did until at the end of the, the publication of the series. It still had a story, and I think they did do the bow out 
and did it gracefully. But to me, it was very, very important that they did that. And people did get to see a finished product that way. Oh, I agree. I think that that's that's a great way to to kind of bring a close to a story to a long term story like that is to yeah let them age out basically um, with something like Dennis the Menace. My fear is that he would just grow up and in high school he would just be Eddie Haskell. Yeah. And, and, then, fate. and then by the time he graduates from high school, he has no friends and nobody likes him and nobody wants to deal with him anymore. And that, that wouldn't really necessarily make for a good story, though. <laughs> I don't know how you have that kind of character still be likable at that point. That, that, that would be my fear with Dennis the Menace is that, I mean, if, if he's still doing what he's doing at 16... I mean, what does that what does that say about him? You know, that he's Tom Green, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? That's Dennis the Menace grown up, <laughs> right? But again, not, not, not many of, friends. <laughs> not, yeah, not a lot of box office staying power there. He's going to end up in a van bought down by the river. Oh, right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You know, I think with the family circus, though, I kind of don't want to see those little kids. That, that was the appeal, is kids say the darndest things, you know? So it's not as cute when a teenager's yelling at you than when a little five-year-old's being cute with it, you know? But it would be neat to kind of see a flash of what they made of themselves, but not a regular thing, you know? Didn't they have comic strips like that, though, where they were older? And I, I'd have to. I, I don't recall, but I'm not going to say they hadn't. You know, they might have done one once in a blue moon, maybe. Yeah. No. Yeah. Like I said, it wasn't like a regular thing. It was just. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would worry that doing that too often would kind of ruin the whole thing. In a way, it would make it less appealing for the to, I mean to, to go back to the little kids I don't I don't know maybe I'm looking at it wrong but I, for me that do, doing the doing them the little kids grown up would it would be it would be harder to go back at that point yeah I think the way they handled it was more like a flashback though where the older scene is actually a flashback if that makes sense <laughs> kind of like the kid got the messy handprint on the wall, and then here he is, 30 years old, and he's yelling at his kid for doing the same thing, kind of thing, you know. Uh, uh, yeah. More of like a flash of you forgot where you came from, kind of thing. <laughs> that's not inherently sad to you. I mean, come on, that's that to me. That's uh, I don't want to see that. Yeah, but I, I think like with Family Circus, it was kind of like the love is. It wasn't just cute. There was always like a moral to what they were telling you. So that one was probably like on Mother's Day or something where it's like, you know, they grow up too quick. And they do. Which is why it would be even sadder to see it in print. <laughs> right. See? <laughs> But as a flash, and then they go back to being kids, and everything's fine, and <laughs> ha ha, not me. <laughs> Do y'all remember that one? Who broke the vase? Not me. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the little dude whose name yep. was not me. Yep. Isn't that a flashback to, like, the Odyssey or something? Come on. There was something about that in the Odyssey. But there was a ghost said, not me. No, there was the the Cyclops got his eye poked out. Yeah, who's, who's, who, you know, the other Cyclops comes up says, who's, who's, who stabbed your eye out? And he's in, no, no man stabbed my eye out. 
well, what the hell? Because because Odysseus wasn't stupid. He told the damn Cyclops his name was No Man. <laughs> Come on, people, read a book occasionally. Yeah. Jesus. I remember that. Now that you say that. Now that I explain it in detail. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since I've read it. <laughs> right, you know. That's vicious. <laughs> <laughs> I just let it roll. <laughs> oh. She just wanted to see how deep I dig my own hole here. That's what she wanted to do. <laughs> that was a good description, though. <laughs> I, will, I will dig the hole deep, believe me. <laughs> I do not necessarily know when to stop. But anyway. Is there a... A uh, character for you, Thomas? I've been trying to think about that. I honestly, I honestly don't know. Um, so you think they'll eventually age the Super Sons? <sighs> well, we've had a couple of stories of Damien in the future, but I don't know about them actually kind of having them grow older. But, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind that too much. But yeah. Once again, they're going to have to be careful because they have parents that are, they still want to have in a certain age range. So they can't really, they can't really change that unless they pull some stunt of. Earth 2. <laughs> somehow. Some, well, <laughs> some, well, somehow they get aged. You know, you know they go, they go, you know, or they go into the future and come back, and when they come back, they come back, you know, that kind of thing. Something. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It, it almost seems to me like it would be more interesting to for for this for it to happen in a situation where you've got a hero and. He's kind of forced. I don't know. I don't know. I, maybe Superman is the best example I can think of of this, where you've got kind of the the best of us all type hero, um, and maybe he's not entirely human or whatever, and so he ages more slowly than everybody else, and so all the I, other heroes kind of die off around him, and he becomes like the last superhero. Um, old man cow. Yeah. And Cal L. Yeah, something like that, where he then a bunch of new young up and comers come up, and you get the old gray grizzled Superman who doesn't walk so well anymore, and has to kind of <laughs> break in the new recruits, as it were. That might be an interesting story to see. <laughs> and now the underwear outside of his leotard is a depend. <laughs> wow! Wow! Oh. Is nothing sacred? I had to. Oh. No, you really did. <laughs> Straight to the potty humor. Okay. Well, he's aging, right? Wow! See, you're judging those the depends thing that people have to be old to need those, and that's just not the case at all. No. <laughs> but I bet a 20-something-year-old wouldn't need them. <laughs> you know? uh, it depends on what happened to that 20-year-old. Yeah, that's Depen- true. Depends on what happened to them. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> depends. The funny thing is they're not paying us a dime to, to keep repeating their name over and over again. But anyway. Yep. It's all free. <laughs> if it wasn't free, you wouldn't need the underwear. But anyway. <laughs> I think it's significant to age a character. And I do not have a problem with it. I just want to make sure they don't go a, uh, to the extreme and have to make everybody age yeah. to get your story across. They did the one millions. Do you remember those, Thomas? The one millions issues? Yeah. 
and they posed the question that their characters were going to be around at that time. So to me, it was pretty significant that uh, the characters or the offspring of the characters were at that position at that time. Yeah, it's an interesting idea, and in the hands of the right writer and the right yeah, artist. Yeah, it could, it could work. It, 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 it's definitely something that could be done and could be very enjoyable. Well, let's go to the other end of it. Okay. Is there a character that you do not want to age? Other than Harley. <laughs> hmm. I have been told I'm a character. I don't want to age. <laughs> yeah, too bad. <laughs> mm. Well, I tried. I can't really... I guess the answer is no. <laughs> well, yeah, but the problem with it is that once you, I mean, once you take the aging factor out, you're pulling your character kind of out of reality a little too much. Yeah. Because, I mean, we all age. And so if, if the characters don't age, then why the hell are they special? Or why are they not like us? And so that, that kind of takes people out of the story. Unless there's a really damn good reason for them to not be aging that's clearly explained somewhere along the line anyway. It doesn't have to be right up front, but somewhere it has to be part of it. It becomes part of the story. And so as long as that's handled right, sure, it's fine. But once it's not, yeah. you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to create a disconnect with your audience, and that's, that's dangerous. When I think, too, though, that's why they don't put an H on a character. They don't want to say Batman is 55 because then you have the 27-year-olds who are like, oh, man, you know, I can't relate to that. Or, you know what I'm saying? I I think that's kind of why they're kind of non, I don't, I don't know the word to use for that. They don't really have a Pacific age because it's usually aimed at the general audience. They don't leave it to you to decide if Batman is, you know, 30 or is he in his 60s, is, you know, kind of thing. Right. If they get too specific, then it, you lose it, them. It can still, you can throw people out of your audience again. Right. Same deal. Right. Yep. But I think if there was two characters who would age, like I said, I in my little mind, I've always had that these superpowers made it to where you really didn't age. But you take a look at, like, Batman who has no superpowers, or Iron Man, they're men. <laughs> you know, so eventually time will have to catch up with them because they weren't bit by that radioactive spider or whatever made, you know, everybody else's unique. So, but I wouldn't want to see an older Batman. Sure, I don't know. surrounded by the supers that aren't aging. Right. You don't, see, you don't want to see Batman aging and Flash and Superman and Wonder Woman are not. Right. Yeah, you know. that get, again, you get into weird story dynamics. You get, yeah. in, you get into the whys and it, it brings to, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't bring them together. It starts to separate them. And that's yeah. not, sometimes that's good for conflict, but it's not always good for team. Well, and being ageless and bold and strong as part of their, dun dun dun, dun you know, they're so. Mm -hmm. You make them old, and they've kind of lost that thunder, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's that fine line between the the disconnect that you want versus the disconnects that you don't want. Right. Right. You, you, I mean, part of what's made them special for so many decades. I almost said centuries, which clearly my sense of time is getting thrown off by this conversation. <laughs> but, but you have them. They've, they've been 
successful and loved for so long Mm -hmm. because they're different in certain ways. But once you start piling things on to that and it just, they just become entirely different, then that's when people start shutting things out. So it's a, it's a balancing act for sure. Yeah. Well, and two, I don't know if I'd want to read a reality book. <laughs> you know, that's the draw to comics. Is it's sometimes it's totally different from the reality we're in. You know, mm-hmm. so not dealing with aging or sickness or you know whatever is kind of the the fantasy appeal to them also. Right, and it's the kind of thing you can leave out of the story and still have a good story. Yeah. It doesn't have it doesn't have to be about that. It, every, not every book has to be about aging or right. how awesome one guy is and that everybody else is normal. It, that's not what it has to be about. Yep. Yeah. And you can come to your own conclusion. Or not. You could yeah. just ignore it. Ignore you could just it. enjoy yeah. the story and not worry about the the temporal recon- repercussions. Yep. You know, like most people, they don't care, and that's fine. That's they they got the entertainment they wanted out of the story, and that's great. Yep. Yep. It's when you start imposing this whole continuity concept on things that it gets weird. Well, and a good story is one that leaves you thinking, where they didn't have to spell everything out for you and dot all the i's and cross the t's. You've kind of left with. You're part of the story, too, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Good talk. Uh, any final thoughts before we wrap things up and take a quick break? Insert no. random age joke here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on the note we will take a quick break and be back with our weekly picks and we're back and it's time for our weekly picks and this week I lead off and for my first choice I'm going with DC Comics and it's Plastic Man number one this is a six-issue miniseries, if I'm not mistaken, uh, written by Gail Smone, with art by Adriana Mello, and the cover is by Aaron Leprosti. This ought to be fun. I know she's talked about Plastic Man off and on for a few years. It's nice seeing uh, Eel getting... A little bit more attention now. Obviously, he's in the Terrifics uh, book, and now he's getting a solo tale, which I don't think they're tied to each other. I, I'm pretty sure it's not, but uh, this could be this could be really fun. I know she's excited about it. Yeah, sounds like fun to me. Mm-hmm. I'm ready for this. Okay, Les, you're up next. My first choice is from Dynamite Entertainment, and this is Deja Thoris number five. Hopefully you've been reading this really good tale. It starts with Deja as a child that becomes the princess, and now she is having to cope with being a leader and finding out how difficult this portion of it is. She is facing a a, uh, torture on Barsoom, which is Mars, that is highly unlikely, and this is death by drowning. Uh, like I said, I hope you've been reading this because this is really good stuff and yeah, hopefully it will carry on for 
quite some time. It's one of my favorite uh, series, mainly because of the John Carter predecessors, and now having Deja Thoris give her, get her own title is has really been fun. Yeah, I cool. agree. It's a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. All righty, uh, Liz. My first pick is The Magic Order by Mark Millar. This is going to be his first comic book that he's doing under Netflix. So, you know, he sold all of it. Well, he didn't sell all of his properties, but he's going to be doing some good stuff with them. But this book is kind of, they're calling it Harry Potter meets um, The Sopranos, (laughs) which after reading a little bit of it, it kind of is. It's kind of present world of magic, but there's wizards and things that are like maybe your dentist or the guy checking you out at the grocery store who keeps all the dark forces away from us. So it should be pretty interesting. And like I said, I think that's a pretty good sum up of it. Harry Potter meets the Sopranos. (laughs) The Magic Order by Mark Millar. Yeah, um, an interesting combination, I have to say. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go near this. <laughs> uh, you could you could get whacked by magic. You could mm-hmm. sleeping with the fishes. Magic is whack. <laughs> <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> oh, and also, there's going to be no second printings on this. So, it's first run, that's it. He says he wants to get back to a time when first run actually meant something. So, he says, and he's teasing us after we see the multimedia that's supposed to go along with this comic book. He says that it'll be sought after, and you'll be glad you picked one up. So, one run. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting trend that uh, Image is doing because, you know, they did that with uh, Oblivion Song, number one. Hmm. Uh, you know, just so, yeah, we're not doing we're not doing a second printing on this book. So you make sure you don't get caught short. I can see that. No, I don't want to feel weird. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be a trend that will catch on. I mean, it would be nice because there are some publishers. It seems like they they do that on purpose. They 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 just basically they order the print run exactly for what's asked for, and then it's immediately out. And then well, we'll do a second and third and fourth or fifth printing. Yeah. Well, it bolsters that collector market. Yeah. Which is why it seems weird to me that publishers are wanting to basically undermine the collector market. I don't know. It seems weird. Uh, I mean, you could see it being undermining the collector's market, but, you know, you're also, you know, limiting some people from picking that book up because hey they may be interested but they don't want to spend 20 or 30 dollars because it's a first print book so you know by the time a a first print is worth 20 bucks there's a third printing already out that's still cover price right i mean isn't that how that usually works i I mean i'm not in the industry right yeah i I Uh, know with my collector pieces it's kind of the difference of only 200 of them being made versus 200,000 of them being made. That 200 is no longer worth anything because the market's been so watered down with product that, you know, it's not even worth what you spent on it half the time <laughs> from a collector well, standpoint. <laughs> well, I can testify to that because I picked up the Killing Joke uh, back in 89 when it first came out back in 89 and at that point it was already $20 for a first print Yeah. Uh, last time I checked which has been a year or two ago it's still only worth 20 bucks 
Yeah. So I'm like, okay, well, obviously you didn't make any money because there's been 500 different printings of of the book, and that's to say nothing of the expanded where you know they have the script or or some pencil work. Or that kind of stuff. So, you know, there's yeah. been so many, so many printings that, you know, yeah, the first print doesn't really mean anything except for, for a collector, but, you know, you're really not making any money. I guess it depends on, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not an expert. It's a, yeah, it's kind of a weird market anyway. Yeah. yeah. Be- because of stuff like that. Because you can't. I mean, the deal is you can't really predict what's going to be worth something when right. you buy it. So you end up buying one of everything and hoping 10% of it is worth more than you paid for it. Uh, it's not, that's, that's, to me, for, for, my, for me, and this is totally just me, that's gambling, and I'm not a gambler. So I can't, I, I, I kind of don't relate all that well to collectors. So, but. I'll Can I? There's just a few people, though, that you just know. I mean, Mark Millar putting out one, you you know it's going to do good. Um, Robert Kirkman puts one out, you know it's going to be good. So it's kind of like a easy gamble, <laughs> you know, because you know their, the, the work that they put out. Right. Okay, Mikey, it's your turn. Okay, it's my turn. Uh, my first book is an image book, and it is called Dry County. This is issue number four. I believe this is a five-issue miniseries. Um, this is this is by Rich Tommaso, um, who's done all kinds of other stuff before. This is interesting, though, because this is kind of sort of a crime story um, by way of... It's a story about a cartoonist who gets who who meets this this woman and then kind of kind of starts getting involved with her and then she gets kidnapped and so he's trying to find her and re- rescue her but he's not really a cop or anything he doesn't really have any investigative skills other than he works for a newspaper but he's a cartoonist he's not really a reporter so it's it's interesting. It, it's kind of a different take on a crime story, so it's it's very cool. Um, very very interesting way of looking at it. Is this done as humor? No, not really. Okay. I mean, some yeah, some of his stuff has been that way in the past, but this is pretty serious. This is, I mean, it's not like super gritty Ed Brubaker type stuff, but it's 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 a pretty serious story. Okay. Alrighty. For my second pick, I stay with DC Comics, and it's another number one. And this is a ongoing Hawkman book, uh, written by Robert Vendetti, and art by Brian Hitch. And this is spinning out of the recently completed Dark Knight's Metal event. And we have Carter trying to figure out what's going on with him because if you're if you're familiar with the character, he's been reincarnated hundreds of times. So he's trying to figure out what his purpose is and all that. So this is uh, this could be really interesting. Uh, Roberts Robert Vendetti is a really good writer. He's been doing a pretty good job on uh, uh, Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns, and he was on Green Lantern before, of course, in all the other other books that he's done. And, uh, so I'm kind of intrigued by this. Uh, of course, Finch's art is always really top-notch, so this should be a good-looking book. Cool. This is a title I've been looking forward to also. Uh, this is a character I uh, grew up with in the 60s and had fond memories of what had transpired. So uh, even though it's going through these 
uh, lifetimes, kind of like Moon Knight does or did. Uh, I'm ready for this. Uh, you're going to have the the mace that uh, Hawkman carries is made of the nth metal. So it kind of gives him the same feel as Thor from Marvel. His his weapon is uh, something that returns to him and he is able to use it to uh, defeat evildoers. Cool. Sounds like fun. Yeah, it should be a real interesting book. Uh, Les, you're up next. For my second book, uh, Dark Horse comes out with a trade of uh, stories, or a story, celebrating the release of The Incredibles 2. The book is called Incredibles 2, Heroes at Home. This just interests me because I was so in love with the first movie and wanted to see exactly what happened that uh, I'm looking forward to to, uh, both seeing the second movie and reading this little byline of uh, stories. Could be fun. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Liz, you're up next. All right. My second one, um, I'm actually kind of cheating on this one a little bit. Um, On Instagram, there's a guy named Johnny Wu, and he takes some of the more popular pop icons and, like, recreate scene with the toys and that kind of thing. So it's kind of like stop animation, but it's not because usually he gets just a really good photograph out of it. So they've taken, they've made a book. And it's called 10 Frames Per Second Architic- Articulated to that five times adventure. Um, so he's going to kind of tell a story now with all of these pictures. So I like his work. I, as a collector also of some of the things that he takes pictures of, <laughs> I find it really interesting. So hopefully some of you guys will too. Cool. Neat. Yeah, yeah. Like looking forward. And it, it is, he's... Like I said, usually it's like Star Wars action figures or something, but some of the pictures he comes up with is just like, how do you even think of that? You know, or how did you do that? <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's, it's definitely different. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> Alrighty, Mikey. Okie dokie. My second book is an image book which I believe makes two for me this week, but I haven't done that in a while, so yeah. Um, This is a new one, though. Um, This one is called Stellar. This is number one, issue number one. Um, And this is a story brought to us by Joe Keating and Brett Blevins. Um, And Stellar is a young woman who is um, traveling the galaxy Figuring, trying to figure out a way to come to terms with the fact that she is essentially an ultimate weapon. And she was used in an intergalactic war, and now she's traveling the, the, the universe that she essentially destroyed, trying to f- kind of figure out how she can live with it. Um, and as much of a downer as that sounds like, it also sounds really interesting. Um, just kind of to see how how she's going to manage to do that. How 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 do you learn to figure out how to how to live with the the things that that you've done, the impacts that you've left in the world? Um, I think it sounds really interesting. It does. Yep. Um, and first regular. Regular series work for Brett Blevins in a long, long time. So I'm excited about seeing his art again. Um, he just did, he was just on the 
two parter Harley loves Joker, and it was great seeing his art there. And so, um, so hopefully he's around for a long time. Okay, uh, in our honorable mention this week. Our honorable mention this week is an IDW book. See, I can pick a not image book. Uh, and this is this is a no-brainer. <laughs> I didn't say this, so... No, 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 I'm bringing this on myself. Um, but this one's a no-brainer. This is the latest trade paperback collection of... The most recent Atomic Robo miniseries, Atomic Robo and the Spectre of Tomorrow. Robo is back. Robo is, for the most part, rebuilt um, after his adventures in the Old West and with the kaiju from the last miniseries. Um, there, in, he is in the process of essentially rebuilding Tesla Dine Institute. Um, and his neighbors are um, none other than Richard Branson and Elon Musk. And there's a whole bunch of really odd stuff going on. And then there's also basically dealing with an HOA, which includes Richard Branson and Elon Musk. So, um Needless to say, <laughs> Robo's life is not getting any less weird anytime soon. So um, it's a whole lot of fun. So check it out. Cool. Yay for Atomic Robo. Mm-hmm. All righty. Any special shout outs this week? No. Not from this end. All right. With that, I will take a couple moments to... Uh, First off, uh, give a shout out to Manny the Martyr for supplying the music to our podcast. We will have a link in our show notes to, uh, to their page where you can, uh, access, uh, some of their music. Yeah, definitely want you to, definitely want you to check them out. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, second of all, I want to, uh, thank the fine folks of Potter and Family who's uh, been spreading the word of the fellowship by retweeting our, our links. Uh, thank y'all guys very much. Uh, you should definitely check them out. Just go to Twitter and do a search hashtag Potter and family. Um, uh, and just pick, pick a show and check it out and let them know that, Hey, put out some great stuff. Uh, thank you guys for your support. And finally, you, dear listener, thank you for downloading and checking out today's show. Uh, we always appreciate your support. Uh, we always value your feedback. If you have a comment, question, suggestion, complaint, observation, whatever, let us know. We, we want to hear from you. And there are several ways you can do that. Email at the fellowship of the geeks.net or you can go to our website and click on the about us tab and there's a contact form uh, that you can fill out and we will get that. You can also follow us on uh, social media on Facebook. We are the fellowship of the geeks. So go ahead and follow us there if you like. And obviously we are on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Feel free to follow us there. Uh, If you like to follow our personal accounts on Twitter, uh, go right ahead. Uh, Mike can be found at Mikey Geek. Liz can be found at Newman underscore L. And I'm at Tom TC Geek. Go give us a, go give us a follow if you'd like and, just say hi. And wherever you download and listen to our shows, whether it's through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, iHeartRadio, or Spotify, we would very much appreciate it if you would rate our show and a review would be awesome as well. 
Any final thoughts before we say goodbye? Um, just thanks, everybody. Thank you. Just keep aging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's better than the alternative. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you for listening once again, uh, guys. We appreciate your support. And until next time, read more comics and support your local stores. We thank you for listening to the show. Comments, suggestions, and questions can be sent to email at thefellowshipofthegeeks.net. You can follow us on Facebook at The Fellowship of the Geeks. And on Twitter at Fellowship Geeks. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>